And I won't even, I won't give anything away. If you haven't heard the story, it's insane. It's just the most, it's a crazy, crazy story. And um, the other Phil here in town, Phil McCausland, uh, got involved and actually had, had the meteorite in his hands. So he wow. gives a talk about that. And he gave me permission to promote that among our ESC centers. So if you guys want to ask him to give a talk, that's excellent too. Great stuff. Anyway, hi to everyone. Howdy. <laughs> You were talking about triangulated irregular networks a few minutes ago with the modeling stuff. And I was involved in TINs for many years, but it was modeling the Earth's surface using TINs uh, for mapping and cartography purposes. So what's the name of the Chinese rocket company? No, come on, come on, everybody. Everybody should know this. I, I know it, but I forgot. Um, hmm. Anyhow, they're the ones that make the big rockets, right? I have a non-technical Chinese rocket company story while we're waiting here. Uh, there was a guy named Dr. Chen in town here who is a member of the Chinese parliament and was a professor out, out at uh, Pearson College. And he was well connected to the Long March Missile Company. That's right, that's them. And they needed a technical uh, presentation while in Victoria on holidays to qualify as a, as a business meeting. So guess who got conscripted? Yours truly with my robotics company. I'd give them all a, a one hour talk on robotics and that was their required robotics technical meeting. And they spent the rest of the time drinking beer and having wine. And there you go. Mm. They offered me a job too, by the way. Was that a salary job or a contract? I don't know. They wanted me to go over to China and inspire their young, lazy workers to work because they just sat around all day, apparently. <laughs> they told me. Okay. Good evening, everyone. It's just uh, uh, on the half hour. We'll just give it a few more minutes as I notice uh, people are showing up. Um, but just on the um, speaking so far tonight, uh, we have a couple of images from Edmonton. Um, and that is all I have heard about. So does anybody else have anything that they would like to show tonight? I have a couple of pictures I could show that I took this week. Sure. That'd be great. clear weather yeah yeah if there's time and interest i could probably uh jump in with a couple and a bit of an account of the plask at night but if there isn't then it can definitely wait oh we want to hear about it yeah no i i would say go ahead dan that would be great i noticed you were here tonight so hoping that uh, you would say something <laughs> with the exciting news of uh having uh the plask on a clear night that was great yeah, that was just kind of fun hanging around uh, you guys for a couple of hours. So I appreciate you being there. Hopefully that's the last one that we have to do without everybody up in the room. And then we can go from um, our comfy living room chairs to huddled on railings and uh, cold out in the dome and uh, playing musical mean, chairs with the three chairs in the office. We have to go back to the real world now. <laughs> yeah. Can yeah, we just stay home where it's warm and I, I can sip on a beer while I watch you guys work? <laughs> the real world has the actual sight, sounds, and smell to go along with it, which kind of uh, makes the Plaskett experience what it is. So um, there's that. At you, least did, that. you did a pretty good job of describing the uh, vagarities of the Plaskett dome mechanics uh, uh, that night evening. So that was good. <laughs> I don't even remember that. I must have been, uh, oh no. <laughs> yeah, you were talking about squeaking wheels and stuff like that. Oh yeah, the uh, the alarm clock. <laughs> it was it it was good fun. I'm uh, I'm really happy that we were able to get up there, um, particularly since the October one wasn't um, wasn't the nicest quality of imaging. I can confirm. I looked at the data, uh, just if anybody was worried, and it was coming from the hole on the floor. 
So when we went up in October, the floor had been pulled out so that they could lower the mirror down and do the recoding. And I've got to say, it's at least striking a magnitude deeper than it had been because 30 second shots were going probably right near the limit for our uh, sky fog per square arc second, so around 20th meg. And um, and we cracked out a pile of them, so that's how we'll, we'll get past light pollution. But it was a lot of fun. Um, I did send out an email. Let me know if you didn't get it. Uh, reach out uh, on any of my emails, and I'll, I'll catch up with you. And um, we managed to sneak in a bonus target. Doug was an absolute trooper and stuck it out until 6.30 when we were rolling out of the parking lot. And then I got to go home. I slept for four hours, and then I woke up and realized I forgot the heater. So I drove back up, turned the heater off, and then drove back home again and slept again. But um, it was a good night. And uh, if, if you have to make a mistake, leaving the heater on is the, probably the best of the bunch. So uh, a lot of fun. Great stuff. Yeah, so it's 25 to uh, the hour. Let's get started. So uh, welcome to the uh, first Astro Cafe of March. And good to see uh, a lot of people here this evening. So that's uh, excellent. Um, on the agenda this evening, we have uh, some photographs from Edmonton. Um, Brock has some things he'll show us. And then uh, Dan will uh, take it away with uh, a discussion of the recent uh, Plaskett session on Saturday. Uh, I guess that was Saturday night, Sunday morning. Um, <laughs> all 12 hours, roughly almost. I guess you were probably there for about 12 hours almost, but uh, getting there. But, uh, and thank you for doing that for us. Um, does anybody else have anything for this evening? Um, I just was going to mention that we have um, some guest speakers booked um, coming up in the coming weeks. And maybe I can just check in with people. I believe, Margie, you've got somebody for March 21st. Is that correct? Sorry, and uh, I'm muted. And uh, I believe, Jeff, we've been talking about somebody for March 28th. Is that right? You're muted too. <laughs> Jeff, you're still muted? Okay, I'm I'm unmuted now. Yeah, um, carry on. <laughs> Deborah, Deborah Lockhurst, who will talk about uh, the uh, uh, Dragonfly Telescope. And so we have that for March twenty first. That's uh, two weeks tonight. And then Jeff, I think we've who's it? We've had Vicky. Is it Siegel? That's right from uh, from uh, Stone Aerospace on um, March twenty eighth. I think you had changed that though to the 28th, if I'm not yeah, mistaken. Yeah, that's the 28th, and I believe she'd agreed to that, but we'd better clarify that. Yeah, I, I will. I was going to wait until after the time change, right? And then, then email her to confirm because I think she's central time zone. So yes, I, I did ask her that question, but I don't think she answered. So, but she, she didn't. No, you 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 okay. laid it all out, but but I want to just confirm with her that uh, that she'll show up at the at the appropriate time. And, and Margie, do you know what time zone Deborah's on? No. <laughs> uh, but if she's not on ours, we can always make sure we start very promptly on those evenings and just. Uh, yes, I have forgotten. I have forgotten because I'm contacting her on Wednesday. Okay, very good. Yeah, if you could just check that with her and. and <laughs> I uh, will. Wonder what's going on, and then um, we have uh, Chris Bohr from the NIMO speaking to us in April. So, uh, so we do have some guest speakers coming up. So that's uh, great. And, hey Chris, excuse yeah. me, Chris. Uh, can I make a suggestion to Margie? Margie, uh, the head of software at at uh, up at the observatory is a lady. Lisa, she used to be, and I I actually talked to her. I actually left a message on her phone the other day. She's a significant, she's a, a lady of significant influence and talent. You might want to talk to her. You and I can chat about it. I can give you her contact information later if you like. Okay. Great. Well, thank you for that uh, lead. It's good to have um, some more people. Um, we are um, slowly moving toward resuming some in-person um, stuff or, or working toward resuming in-person uh, Astro Cafes, but we're not quite there yet. But um, 
we'll uh, keep you posted as we uh, go along. We want to check out the uh, technical capabilities of the uh, network um, in uh, at, for the Fairfield Gorge, um, I don't know, the uh, Fairfield and Zollis Community Association, um, just to make sure that we can still use Zoom because we'd like to keep this uh, approach where people can join us in person or online, because that seems to be um, highly desired. So uh, just mention that too. Um, I just thought I saw a name, um, not to put anybody on the spot, but it looks like uh, Raymond Fisher. I'm not sure I've ever seen your name before. So if you're new to the group, uh, welcome. And thank you for joining us this evening. Thank you. Uh... I just finally signed up for the first time in January and we moved to British Columbia about two years ago. So yes, I am indeed new. Yeah, well, I'm glad you, uh, you uh, joined us this evening. I, I would say I didn't think I'd seen your name here before. but uh, And uh, I see uh, Clint's joining us this evening too and I haven't had Clint for a while. So I've seen Clint for a while. So uh, welcome as well. Sorry, Margie, you were going to say something? Chris, I should just remind folks that um, uh, Dave Payne is now uh, vice president. Uh, no. Yeah, that's right. Gary's, no, uh, Gary, Gary Sedan is He's now VP2. Yeah. Is now VP2. Uh, so although I'm still in charge of women, <laughs> I'm interested in what women are doing. So you you can you can uh, give me information about women in terms of um, presentations. And Gary is the person who is um, now in charge of uh, speakers. Although we have some kind of pre-booked speakers coming, um, and Gary knows about them. Yeah, and we've also had like Jeff stepped up and found people for us too, which has been great. So thank you for doing that as well. And if anybody else has leads on speakers, please feel free to, uh, um, you know, if you want to make contact with somebody you know or know of, um, make contact and then we can coordinate a date, which is basically uh, what we've been doing. So, yeah, I have a question then. Um, how many speakers do you want? Well, it's, as this is kind of replacing our monthly meeting at the moment, we have been trying to get maybe is one a month. Um, some months we haven't had any, and now we've got three in the next, what, about uh, six weeks. So that's okay. Okay. It's kind of what we're aiming for, I think, is. Uh... Ah, and Clint says Melissa's there too. Okay, well, welcome both. It's uh, good to have you join us tonight. Thanks. Nice to see you all. <laughs> Um, so anyways, let's um, get started with, uh, if Dave is ready, we'll all share the yep. screen and we've got the uh, Edmonton photos here. Uh, so let's just uh, see if this is going to work for me here. Okay. And come on. And from the beginning, there we are. Yeah, so th these two are from Tom Owen in Edmonton. Uh, he captured these on February 25th and 26th. Uh, he's using, it's the first time he's used his new AstroTech 115 millimeter triplet at F5. He used a Hotec field flattener and for his QSI 683 CCD. Now, M42 is uh, six minute subs, uh, three in hydrogen alpha, two in oxygen, two and four in sulfur three for a total of 54 minutes. He stacked them in DSS and processed using star tools. So there's a fair bit of data there for 115 millimeter scope. The next one is the Virgo galaxy cluster, he calls it. This is my favorite part of observing in the spring. This is what I call the start of Markarian's chain. Um, the one on the, on the right is 80, M84, and then the bright one in the center is M86. Uh, there's two little galaxies off to the left of the starter Markarian's chain. Uh, and the one on the bottom, I, I have never seen that shape that is warped like that before in a scope. It's obviously much too faint to see uh, visually, but certainly it's quite interesting in that uh, and that, and that one is uh, totally that, that exposure is uh, 10 six minute subs uh, for luminance and five each in R, G and B for a total of two and a half hours. So that's, that, 
that's what I love about the spring. <laughs> that cluster there. There's eight galaxies in one shot. Yeah, that turned out very well. So you must be pleased with that. <laughs> yeah. Great. Well, thank you very much for sharing that with us. I'll stop that now. And there we are. Um, yeah. So uh, I think that was it from Edmonton this week. It's been quiet over there, I guess, otherwise. but uh... Not exactly quiet. <laughs> the stuff they're talking about is too complicated for today. <laughs> uh, very good. Okay, uh, Brock. They've been, do they've been doing a couple of astrophotography workshops is basically what they've been up to. Right. Okay. Very good. Hi. Yeah, we had some good weather finally. So... Uh... Friday night and Saturday night and even last night. So let me share what I've been up to. So the, uh, I, I assume you guys can see something. Mm -hmm. I First okay. night, uh, Friday, I wanted to try out capturing uh, some stuff up in the Orion constellation before it disappeared out of sight because it's moving pretty quickly to the west and it won't be visible for much longer. So um, M78 is uh, a nebula just kind of up above and to sort of to the east of um, the Horsehead Nebula. And uh, it's a reflection nebula with a bunch of stars in amongst this area here. And it also has some really interesting dark nebula that's kind of over top of it, blocking uh, a lot of it as well, which is kind of an interesting mix. I was hoping to capture it. It's a much darker target than I expected, so I didn't really get enough time on the target. This is actually with uh, six hours and 20 minutes total, but even with that, it's still a bit on the noisy side. But uh, I actually did this both Saturday or Friday and Saturday night the beginning, the first few hours of the dark before it fell below the horizon. And then uh, I had the system set up so that after this disappeared out of sight, it would move on to another target, which of course is in the sky later in the day, night, which of course would have to be a galaxy. So uh, M106 is a really beautiful galaxy that uh, I hadn't photographed before. And uh, so this was the second target of the night. So this again was two nights of data collected and worked out to about almost eight hours in total in this image and uh, 300 second exposures. And all of these are without any filters too because we didn't have a moon so, or not much of a moon, especially as it got later. So I was able to go without filters, which was kind of nice. And then last night I put everything away. Well, not everything, I put, put my telescope away left my mount outside because it was cloudy. So I thought that was probably it. And then about seven o'clock, I looked out the window and went, it's clear again. OK. So putting your telescope away is a good way to affect the weather. You can make it turn clear pretty effectively. So I, uh, given that I had managed to change the weather, I put my telescope back out. But this time, I put out my small scope in a big hurry and managed to capture. Uh, I wanted a wide field just to show the relationship between the Orion Nebula um, M42 and uh, the Horsehead. And so managed to capture uh, this just last night uh, in just a couple hours. So it's kind of cool to do that. And also I created a starless version because it really shows a lot of the detail. There's so much going on in between these two. It'd be nice to brighten it up. If I got more time on it, I could probably boost up the exposure or boost up the brightness of some of that dim stuff without it turning to a big noisy mess. But uh, is it is pretty neat. That M106 galaxy was quite fascinating. The um, As Laurie mentioned, it seems to be warped. And also there's that yes. funky, uh, funky galaxy in the bottom of the field. Yeah. Yeah, there's actually quite a few galaxies in this shot as well. Oh, the main M106, there's this, there's one here, here. There's this yeah, that one. one, one that's was... probably, it's kind of analogous to uh, M31 in that it looks like a little um, 
like it's not just another distant galaxy it might be part of what caused it to get all warped looking i don't know yeah but there's i think there was another one up in this upper corner but uh Mark, I had a curiosity question on that galaxy shot that you have oh, there. Sure. And, and it's because I don't understand, you know, how the filters are doing what you're doing. But I noticed when I look near the center of that galaxy and I, I look at what looks like an orbital plane, both on the, I guess, the left side and the, the right side, yes. I see different colored dots that look like they could be planets. And on the other side, but usually isn't coloration like that reflective of different types of stars? Like what, what are we seeing there when we see those moving dots? Uh, the dots, it depends which dots. Some of the dots might be stars, but then there are these red right areas. There. Yeah, that. That is actually a nebula. So that is basically, if we look in our own galaxy out into the Milky Way, right, we'll see red stuff like this, right. which is a nebula in our Milky Way galaxy. And in this galaxy, this is actually a nebula in that galaxy. So it's it's essentially an equivalent thing. It's basically, a there's probably some stars that are in a big ball of hydrogen gas and they're emitting high energy photons, ultraviolet or X-rays or something that are exciting those hydrogen atoms. And, gotcha. and then they glow and give off that red light, which is pretty <laughs> distinctive, to you, pretty much know that that's most likely going to be hydrogen right and when you see the blue and the yellow dots next to them those are different gases that are that are reacting some of it could be other gases and it could also be uh blue uh stars it could be young stars that are blue but it it's hard to know because right. this galaxy is too far for me to resolve any actual stars in it uh, andromeda is close enough that we can actually see distinct stars in the galaxy, but this one is a bit too distant. So if we're seeing any sort of blue, it's it could be a cluster or clumps of blue stars, or it could be some regions that are high in oxygen. Oxygen emissions are also potentially causing some color, right. but they're more of a turquoise than a, than a real true blue. Uh, and, Brock, Brock, what's the idea of this galaxy? What is the what? What, what, <clears throat> which galaxy is this? This is M106. M106, okay. Yeah. And Brock, the one that's just, if you were to go from your mouse straight diagonally towards the corner of the screen, uh, bottom right, there is a bright yellow dot in that galaxy, further left. It's right up in the galaxy. Oh, in, oh, here. Right there, yeah, yeah. That's probably a foreground star. Gotcha, thank you. Yeah, I would, yeah, I think anything that looks like a star in this general area is probably just a star in the foreground because there's still a fair amount of the Milky Way in between us and that galaxy. So. so a star in our galaxy. Yes, exactly. Yeah. yeah. I get it, thank you very much. Yeah. Very nice, Brock. But yeah. And this one, again, it was rushed, so my framing wasn't very good. I should have, but it was, I was making some stuff on the barbecue and trying to set up back and forth and it was rushed it looks almost artistic like you've done it with watercolors you know um brock could you go back to m78 please? sure yeah i i tried to get um i was targeting that i think it was a friday night it was a mm -hmm. nice clear night and i could barely resolve it or just just see a, a faint smudge of that with my uh, daub eight inch is it uh, is that a function of just um, it's a is it is described as a bright nebula in, in the documents but it didn't it didn't pop yeah. out. I yeah I think I was looking through my eight inch daub uh, and I don't think I saw it I I was it was actually last night while I was imaging the uh, the Orion stuff and I I was looking around a bit and I I could really only see. I mean, the Orion Nebula itself is always dead simple to see, but yes, yes. With with my eye adaption and my ancient eyeballs, I well, they're mm -hmm. not that ancient, but they're old enough. But I I couldn't I can't make it out. It's pretty dim though. Like when I think about the exposure required and it compared to the Orion Nebula, it's not very bright. Where were you know. observing from, Brian? From Cattle Point. There's too much like the transparency hasn't been great. 
but mm-hmm. in my backyard, I was getting it with my four inch refractor pretty easy. Yeah. Last last night. I was out with it last night. I'll we'll have to go east. But but west. you need to put, <laughs> you have to put something over your head too. Because it's a re- yeah. the, the it's a reflection nebula, so it's not gonna be glowing the same. Yeah. Mm. To beat the transparency. It probably helps to have your eyes adapted too. Go 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 lower power too. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That. Then you put more field around it, and it'll show up better. No, a UHC won't help because it's a reflection nebula. Mm-hmm. <laughs> they only work for emission nebulas. Right. Thank you. And did I see a picture you sh- was when you first tuned in, Brock, of the California nebula? Yeah, that was my desktop. Okay, I'm just giving a heads up. There's a comet going to be passing underneath that nebula somewhere between Comet Borelli, somewhere between the 23rd and about the 27th. So if you had a good wide field to pick it up, I'll put the map into the chat. And what does the weather forecast look like for that range? I have no idea. That would be ridges. Oh, come on. I don't think my app goes out that far. Yeah, I know. That's a long ways away. But it's a, it's a reasonably bright comet. It's like 10th magnitude. So there may be a chance. It just depends on how it actually turns out. Thanks for uh, showing those, Brock. Those are, have turned out really well. Thanks. You're getting some, uh, you get some, you've actually got quite a good spot there, I think. Yeah, it's pretty dark. It was very nice last night. Let's hope the change to the lighting in your nearby, your neighbors there won't impact it too much. But. Yeah, I don't think they had the lights on until well past midnight or something, because they certainly weren't on early, because it was just too nice out for that to have been the greenhouses. Yeah, it was certainly made. glow. Yeah. And yeah. in fact, the fact that I got that galaxy, the galaxy was m- m- further and I think if those greenhouses were on, I wouldn't have gotten that much resolution or that nice background because I don't remember seeing the background brightness in those shots jump up after midnight, which is sometimes when they turn the lights on. Good. Thanks. So I think we're over to Dan. Okay. I can do this. So I guess on the theme of Brock mentioning old eyes, I can tell everybody that I'm just getting plain old. Uh, uh, my bounce back time was much longer than it has been trying to come back from a night of observing like that. But here we all are. So I just thought I'd share, I clipped this into the the uh, data set. But this is just, I think, six minutes of data on the um, on the horse head. From, from the Plasket when I was still trying to figure out how long I was going to shoot subs. Um, if anybody's interested, the Plasket's a wow. 9.25 meter focal length. So unfortunately, auto guiding hasn't been working cooperatively with the Newtonian focus for uh, at least the way I was taught to use it for a, bit, a fair chunk of time. So I've had to shoot everything un- unguided yet again. Uh, when I turned on the guiding, it just uh, turned the stars into a streak. Mm. So. This was a three minute sub and then three one minute subs unguided with just a normal red filter, nothing um, fancy for cutting light pollution or anything else. And it was able to punch through and pull out quite a bit of detail in the the head itself, which um, if if that doesn't get you a little bit excited for the data, nothing will. The flip side of where you shouldn't be quite as excited are that the Plaskett data is a bit tricky to work with. So bad columns will be in there. Um, dust motes can't always be calibrated out because they like to move around as the night goes on. And you have this weird um, meshing or, or kind of grating on the, the sensor. And I think that that's either something smudged on the sensor or damage to the sensor surface itself. But um, if you just ignore the cosmetic imperfections and focus on the lovely pictures of the, the galaxies and the horse head, it's, uh, it's how you, uh, you stay happy with all of this. And it was a, a lovely night. I don't know how many, if everybody caught what I was saying at the beginning, 
but we were there for um, a full 12 hours. I think that about 10 and a half of those were imaging or active use of the telescope, which was pretty good. Um, I haven't done much better than that on a plastic night. To give an old account, um, when I was looking back at the, the research on the observatory I used um, a few years ago for my thesis, the uh, original observers would have a game where they'd try and observe the longest night of the year. So I don't feel like I got off light at 12 hours, but often they would uh, try and get the longest night, of course, in December. And if they pulled it off, they were doing something like an 18 hour shift when you figured in the amount of time it took to get set up, get on target, and then run for the entire 14 plus hour winter night. So uh, we, we tried our best, but we're not quite as uh, tough as they were. And um, then... Dan, there was a question from Martin. Maybe you could, oh, you could ask sorry. it and you could answer it. Oh, the Plaskett is the telescope itself. Um, so John Stanley Plaskett was the original director and the designer of the observatory. Uh, he's pretty much a rock star of Canadian astrophysics, given that I would argue the entire institutional astrophysics success of Canada as a nation is more or less built on his back, just like the educational aperture was built on the back of Chant. And he, uh, worked in in victoria for the later part of his career starting with uh okay okay so anyway the telescope's named after him because he was the designer so it's the, the 1.8 meter or 72 inch aperture uh big reflector on the hill in victoria so uh if you ever spot the telescope dome as you're driving by that's what we were using which is why it was such a unique opportunity because there aren't many RASC centers that get to play with that kind of equipment, particularly not that kind of equipment that's well maintained and still in scientific working order. Um, I haven't heard anything back. I did put our name in for a couple more nights in the coming quarter, but recognizing that we've been pretty lucky all this year, already this year, um, and we've had four across the last two uh, quarters, two of them were usable. One uh, had some issues though. Uh, I, I don't know whether we'll be able to, to get another one quite so quickly, but cross your fingers. And if we do, then we get to go galaxy hunting uh, again, uh, this time with a little bit better situation to go after the galaxies. And, uh, oh, go ahead. Just, I was going to say, Martin, does Martin know about the, the spectroscope and all the stuff that's on it? That's all. Probably not because we okay. don't always use it, but no. it's, it has two focuses. So it has a Cassegrain focus where you can use the spectrograph at F20 off the bottom. And then what we were using is the Newtonian focus, which is F5. And the camera's a older chip. As I mentioned, it's about uh, the size of two full frame camera, uh, camera sensors laid end on end. So it's very long and narrow, like an old plate slide. And uh, I think that it peaks still at about 84% quantum efficiency. And uh, we had it running quite well. It was running at negative 110 the whole night without really fluctuating more than a couple degrees. So I don't think the darks will be terribly necessary. They are necessary at negative 103. At that point, it gets pretty warm. But... And I don't have a fancy slideshow uh, set up tonight. So uh, if you'll bear with me, I'll just use Zenfolio. We were up at the VCO recently. I posted it to the list a couple of Fridays ago or last Friday, I can't remember which. And uh, we managed to get a bit of test time in on the new telescopes. And I just wanted to share some of the output from the Takahashi. This is a pretty quick hour and 15 minutes of frames um, with my Canon RA just slapped on the back of it. And if I go this way, you can see that even out at the edge of the frames so that we could use the 12 inch at the same time. It's showing up a really wonderful image. There's a lot of detail in M81. And M82, uh, you can see the structure in the center. I probably didn't handle these best, but um, there's still a lot of background galaxies poking out around the frame um, pretty much wherever you look. So again, quite exciting to see the VCOs so near uh, operation again and that we're, we have such fine equipment to work with. So huge thanks to all the members of the tech, tech committee who have been leading the, the charge on that. And then just some images from far worse locations to image from. So these are these are all going to be from downtown, but I've been trying to get around the light pollution with filters. And I realized that narrowband stars aren't really worth it anyway, because they're all kind of monochrome and uh, depending on your telescope, in my case, they're a little bit bloated. So uh, I shot a few frames and for most of them, I struck the stars out. So this is a, a shot I did in February of the Horsehead Nebula. 
And I think it's just about seven hours, but uh, most of it was in, in hydrogen alpha, which allowed me to pull up quite a bit of structure. And that was a, a fun one. Joe, I think I have an idea for how to get rid of these two halos, but uh, I'm not certain about this one. I think it might be an internal reflection. So I might have to get created, creative when I try and pull it out. Um, this was yeah, one. It, uh, it looked like an internal reflection to me too, the way the alignment was in the image. So yeah, yeah that that telescope it, it does a great job of pulling in the light but it does not handle stray light very well at all it, <laughs> well, it's, uh, not as, it's not as though you have uh, ideal conditions there in the middle of the city <laughs> um well i i had to stop using the ra because the car the car light lots would uh cause just these big streaks in oxygen three <laughs> if i if i tried using that camera but if you go back one second then oh, yep i think i can do that Oh, sorry, I've got a big stack of images over here. Here we go. So Alton X, of course, a, a problem because it's so bright. Yep. But but that one like to the um, bottom left of the horse head itself, that's actually that's nebulosity. Yeah, that's a reflection, isn't it? It that that's a cool one. I wouldn't want to remove that one because it, it <laughs> No. It, it's actually a star behind some clouds it looks like right yeah but i think like this is a reflection down here i'm pretty sure and i think it's coming off this so it looked like yeah. this guy might might be bouncing here and here but i i can't complain too much the the telescope was kind of cheap uh on, on the order of cheap and uh, it does a good job and then I, I reworked the same kind of starless field for um lagoon nebula just focusing on the nebula instead of trying to save the stars and they really detract from it when i added them back in so i left it out and then i uh, tried to rework as best i could this data i took on the the swan um i think this guy was just too faint from downtown uh, i couldn't i've tried three or four times on this data set and this is the best i could do but it, it um it's really tricky i don't know why dan um laurie has a question oh go ahead um dan in the first the first um, picture with the Horsehead Nebula, up on the top, on the, almost on the very top, there seemed to be like a bubble, a small bubble. That was it wasn't light; it was dark. Um, small bubble on so the just, um, uh, It's probably right a dust smoke. Okay, up, up on the like it's up in the top, the top left-hand corner, right there. This guy? Yes. So this is really cool, and this is where this entire region is fascinating and honestly there's few places we can look in the milky way that aren't but um what you're seeing is a dark uh, something either a dark nebula or a black globule but you're seeing the flow of material getting pushed out by all attack which is what's causing all of this get pushed around a denser region so you still have a bit of ionizing on that flow but in here you would have more material that's not letting light light through and so you would see this type of a shape um, there are some good examples of it uh, over here and they come up every now and again in different nebula but I, I find that when the stars are gone I can I can see them better with my eyes the same effect is happening with the horse itself where if you look at that you can see the the matter flowing around the denser region that's sitting here okay it but, just looks um, like this bubble floating in space <laughs> Me. So, cool. and Gary, yeah. uh, Gary, you had a question. Yeah, Dan, uh, the uh, horse head with the three minute exposure is pretty stunning, quite frankly. Um, do you notice how small the stars are with such a big scope, even with no guiding? Like, good grief. Yeah, I didn't um, really do star reduction to these. I did pull them out to process the background and then I added them back in at a uh, 0.7 uh, times ratio. But yeah. I, like I haven't reduced them, they just I didn't make them very bright. So um, I was wondering, a uh, uh, smart guy like you must have figured out, I'm sure, compared to uh, let's say a 10-inch scope, uh, how big is this thing across? It's probably 10 arc minute. No, 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 no. The, okay. the, the mirror on the scope. 1.8 meters, so six oh. feet. Uh, oh. Seven. No, six feet. So since area goes up as a square of the radius, I wonder how many more, how many 
more times like this thing can bring in in, th in three minutes than a regular scope. It's got to be like tons. It it would be. The, the funny thing about it is that it can suck in a lot of light, but we're limited by the same sky. It's so like from the VCO, if we were set up properly, I think that we could outgun this in terms of resolution and in terms of total integration if you gave it enough time. Because as long as you expose long enough to get up to whatever the sky fog limit is, so around here it's about 20th meg, your exposures are hitting the same depth. What the plasket can do, though, is because it has so much focal length and so much resolution, even though you're limited by the same sky, it's, it has the contrast to see yeah. all these shapes because it's slamming them across enough pixels. And that's the part that we can't compete with, where like I think the brightness of the horse, um, all of the rest of this would be about the same for us if we were using an F5 scope. It's just that the Plasket does it by spreading it out over so much of the sensor that you can see details that we can't um, mm. catch quite the same way. But it, it, I think it's on the order, uh, I think I did the math once, Gary, and I think it's something like 150 seconds per second mm. for an average uh, amateur scope. So every minute would probably be around an hour, maybe a bit more. Wow. Which is why with 10 hours or seven hours, this doesn't look anywhere near as sharp. Yeah. And uh, finally, I was working on Thor's helmet, which is a um, another one of those fun nebula that you don't always get to play with because it's down fairly low in the south. but. Um, this one was a struggle. It's the only one that I used oxygen as a luminance layer for it, uh, because it's quite a bit brighter than the hydrogen or the sulfur on this. And uh, you know, that I think that this is a good example of where using a small uh, four-inch telescope can't live up, because once you have a fairly tiny target like this, I just wasn't getting quite enough light on it. So I, I think this is 10 or 12 hours, and it still uh, doesn't look like it's gone too deep. And I think that's me out of images. Yes. Mm -hmm. I've struggled on Thor's helmet. I haven't even shown anyone my attempt. It's pretty lackluster. <laughs> it took way more than I thought. It's a tricky one. I've, I've gone back twice now, and it's kind of left me wondering whether I was using the right equipment both times. I think from the VCO, the 12 inch there would be um, brilliant to chase it down. So it's also so low in the horizon. It's in the atmosphere so thick, and it's just. The guiding isn't as good because of the atmosphere and it's, it's wobbling all over the place. Yeah, it's not. Mm. I, I thought what about trying like. to chase it with the plasket, but it just was outside of the range. It was just too low. Oh. Your photo looks like what it looked like through my 20 inch 10 days ago from Pearson. Ah, uh, Bill, you show off. You could I, see the featheries to the feathers on the helmet and all that stuff. Wow. It was very wow. nice. It was a good night. When I was but you're on, to... you're on your knees on the concrete. So I'll, I'll share a little uh, account here to encourage anybody who is interested to go to Pearson when Bill's there. He had hosted Matt and I, I think, last summer, or maybe the summer before during the pandemic. And he had his telescope out and put the, the thing onto the Veil Nebula. And if you just take out the color aspect because our eyes aren't great at seeing color at night and think about it in terms of a monochrome picture. It was as good as any photo that I've ever captured of that region and then some. And he was just doing this with his daub. It was utterly incredible. So. And then when yeah. I showed you the dumbbell too. Oh, that too, yeah. It was just out of this world. It was like seeing pictures with your eyes, which you know, I suddenly understood why aperture fever was a real thing and promptly checked when I was back on the plastic schedule. <laughs> but um, yeah, so uh, as I as I mentioned, I shared the, the data. If um, it's it's a bit temperamental at times, so if anybody has any questions, just fire them my way. And as I produce masters, I'll uh, try and upload them if uh, if I think that they're reasonably clean, just so that people can. Uh, work off of a calibrated integration, maybe with the, the background dealt with or something so that it's uh, more user friendly. Good, good. Hey, Chris, could I just share one image? Sure. Okay, thanks. I'll try and figure out how to do this again. Share. 
And while you're doing that, there's a question for Bill from Leslie, uh, Les Welsh. You guys see anything? Uh, yes, we can. The Horsehead Nebula? Yes. Hopefully. This is one of the first images I ever took. And um, if you take enough exposures, it actually works out pretty good. But you, you'll notice how sharp, how this is not as sharp on the edges as it was with the with the plasket. Like, wow, what a difference. And over here, I don't know if you can see my mouse or not, on the nose of the horse head, mm -hmm. that, you, that's a pretty substantial star. On the plasket, it's teeny weeny. So it just shows that the big scopes really resolve well. Okay, now, how do I stop sharing here? Uh, there should be a red stop share up at the top of your screen. Uh, nope. Oh, yeah, here we go over here, yeah. Yeah, exactly. Right. I mean, for a uh, for any of us, Gary, that's still a remarkable image. It's not um, the horse head's not easy, particularly not to get the kind of resolution that you're getting in the head. Yeah, I don't, I don't think that um, I've actually seen an amateur one that goes quite quite so far down. I I, I don't feel like I get to claim the plasket is using amateur equipment, so I don't. <laughs> oh, yeah. Well, let's hope I can. Let's hope I, once I get the same machine set up here, it still does that. I'm kind of wondering about it. And your stars are nice and round. Mm -hmm. So your collimation's good. Yeah. And your tracking's I'm, good. I'm a collimation freak, and I still haven't figured out how to do it properly. For those of you that own Newtonians, don't buy a Newtonian if you want to figure out coll collimation, let me tell you. My goodness me. That's not Great. that hard. Hey, thanks for... Uh for showing us those photos, Dan and uh, and Gary. Um, Martin, I believe you had something to show us too. Uh, sure, yeah, it was just a, a quickie, just because um, we, we saw that picture from Edmonton and I realized I had a, uh, I took a picture of Mark Carey and his chain this weekend. Uh, you all seeing that? Yes, we can. So this is just an hour, um, I just, I just, uh, I'd done what I wanted to do for the night and um, just decided to point it in the general direction of Mark Herring's chain uh, because it's, uh, I, I can't remember who was showing it earlier on, but it's just, uh, it's absolutely one of my favorite parts of, of the sky at this time of the year because it's just an, it's just an insane clutch of, of, uh, of galaxies. Um, so this is just an hour. I just had an hour on it. This is on a, uh, a 80 millimeter, uh, refractor um, and I haven't really done any tidy processing on this yet it's just I just quickly threw them into the the weighted um, batch pre-processing script um, but it's just uh, and I just did a little bit of star reduction on it just to see uh, how they look but I just I kind of love the sort of I don't know kind of tadpole -y shape or something like that um, but it's just because uh, it, we, we saw that little a glimpse of Markarian at the beginning. I thought I'd, uh, I'd show more of it. I, I know Dan was counting the galaxies in the last picture. I'm not sure if he's counting them in this one, but uh, he's going to run out of fingers very quickly because there's, there's, <laughs> there's dozens and dozens and dozens of galaxies everywhere in this particular bit. Um, and another little bit that I got from the weekend was uh, I did the rosette, did that one, but I thought this was interesting. This is just a single frame from the uh, uh, Alan attack area, and uh, I just throw, throw it up because I think this is an iridium flare. If anybody knows anything more or better than that, um, it's a satellite going straight through. But uh, for anybody that's not familiar with iridium flares, it's uh, it's a it, it as it spins, it gets brighter in uh, in a long exposure like this. So that's what uh, that's what that is. I think it is, unless anybody's got any other information on that. Iridium, Mar Mar Martin, I'm not sure if the iridiums are still up. Um, I don't know. I'm not sure. We could check. It's but, the only uh, thing I can think of that, that actually flares. Well, um, sometimes meteors kind of bulge and go away, or or it, it could be something with a reflective uh, reflective area on it. Yeah, this, this is a good question. Don't we still call them iridium, iridium flares, even if it's the solar panels of a non-iridium satellite? Oh, that's an interesting question. question. I don't know. 
but I thought yes. I thought they were decommissioned. But for years. I'll I'll have a look. Uh, Martin, what what sensor are you using for these? Uh, this is a uh, I use a Nikon uh, D850 uh, DSLR for everything. Okay. And so, is that an unmodified shot there of the horse, said Martin? This is all everything I do is unmodified. I have no modifications on anything. Yeah, it's I'm, a stock I'm, a stock 850, I think. Just a that's, stock 850. Yeah. So. That's really nice HA response from. It. That was uh, that's uh, ice, uh, part of um, Flaming Star Nebula. Oh, I should have asked anybody if they knew what that was. Uh, Flaming Star Nebula, I, I see 405. I, I shot quite a bit of data. Actually, it was the first weekend I had a chance to run two rigs at the same time. Uh, I had one facing south, which was the small refractor, and then the 8-inch finally getting some data into the 8-inch SCT, which is what this is. Um, and then uh, and I've I have barely done any processing on anything yet. So this is the only one I've really processed fully. And it's, uh, it's from both nights of data. So this is two hours, 25 minutes of data on the rosette um, on the, the small refractor with the D850. Um, I'm quite, quite, quite pleased with it, I think. Beautiful, it's beautiful. It's lovely. It's, yeah, as, I say, as I said on the list, I was really impressed with the uh, color preservation you did on the stars. It's really lovely. Yeah, very nice. I just looked up. I just looked up Iridium satellites. There's 75 in orbit as of 2019, with nine in uh, spares in geocentrical orbit, synchronous orbit, and they're projected to last for 15 years. So I, I guess they still are up there. I didn't know. Yeah, that. I was. I wasn't sure about that. Well, um, Iridium, of course, is providing a satellite uh, telephone service across the globe. So. Yeah. So I guess it might have been an iridium flare, right? I I thought they were uh, replacing the first generation iridiums with another generation that don't flare. That's what I thought as well. Um, yeah, that's right. Was that right? Usually, when I uh, when I find something interesting going through a sub, I'll fire up that that time and area in uh, Starry Night, and it usually will show me whatever it is that's going past. Uh, but I could not find anything in the sort of 10 minute span of these frames um, that, that, that showed what this satellite was going through that, uh, that part of the sky. So I don't know. If anybody's interested, this is just the starless with the, uh, the reduced stars. Um, the way I've just started doing the star reduction recently because it's, uh, I've not been happy with it until very recently. And now I'm finally starting to get what I think is a, a, a fairly nice star reduction for, for these. Um, so I'm using Starnet 2, if anybody's interested, I'm using Starnet 2 to, to create the star mask and then I'm layering it up in, uh, in Potato Shop and uh, doing uh, various different bits uh, over those. So that's kind of that's kind of it. Uh, that's all I had really. It was just ma mainly that Markarian's one just because it, uh, it was brought up previously. But I'll stop sharing. Very nice. I really yeah, like thank that. you for showing those. Thanks. Getting some, uh, everybody's getting some great shots. It's uh, <laughs> good job. Um, I don't know if um, Chris Gaynor, do you have anything for us this evening? Because I think that's through the people who wanted to present. Uh, is there anybody else who wants to present while I'm asking Chris that question? Um, actually, it's basically pretty quiet uh, on the uh, JWST front right now. I mean, they're continuing to uh, uh, to do their work, but there's uh, there's no real headlines. And, uh, and otherwise, they're just kind of watching the whole situation with the, uh, the Russian space program. There's not much to say beyond uh, uh, what I was saying last week, although there was a, a, a Russian news agency that posted a, a, a video of astronauts and cosmonauts saying goodbye to each other, and then the Russian section of the ISS splitting from the US section. But uh, you know, so far that's that's continuing to uh, uh, to operate, but. Um, I just, I just think we are now 
coming to an, the end of a uh, of kind of a, an era with uh, with Russia as an active participant in international space programs. You know, they, Europe has already kind of split up. I remember I said the ExoMars launch is off. That was going to be a rover that was going to go to Mars and search for life. Um, that will probably show up in the next uh, Martian launch site cycle in uh, in uh, 2024, and on top of a probably a European launch vehicle from from Kourou. And the Russian staff have withdrawn from Kourou because um, they were launching some of their Soyuz rockets there. That's probably over for the time being, and uh, and. Uh, Sort of everybody around the ISS is gritting their teeth, but uh, um, the uh, the one comment I can make about that is that uh, the the timing, you know, uh, you can't ever say that an event like this war is a good timing. But you know, if if say this something like this had happened a few years ago, it would have been much more difficult for the uh, Americans, but now they have the Dragon spacecraft going up to the uh, ISS, um, and they also have the means of of boosting the ISS if the Russians stop that service. Um, right now, there's a guy up up there called. And there's there's uh, three Americans, one German, uh, and two Russians, and one of the Americans is a guy named. Uh, Mark Vandehei, who is supposed to be uh, setting the record for um, uh, the longest American stay in space, like uh, close to a year. And um, he was supposed to, he's supposed to come back on a, uh, on a, on the Russian Soyuz spacecraft, and that is still the plan. Um, I suppose the, uh, you know, the, uh, the uh, the Soyuz they land in Kazakhstan and of course uh, Kazakhstan is effectively under uh, Russian control. Uh, you know they do have their own government and all that, but uh, but uh, all, not all that long ago the uh, the Russian army paid a visit to Kazakhstan when the uh, when there were some riots in the capital city and the president of Kazakhstan asked for help. But uh, anyway that might allow that to continue, but maybe maybe uh, Mark Van High will have a longer stay up there and he'll come back on a dragon. So we'll just have to see. So uh, that's kind of all I have to say right now. Great, thanks for the update. Uh, Dave, you have a question? Dave Robinson? No, no, no I'm good. Okay, your hand got raised, that's all. Oh, I don't know how that happened. <laughs> Okay, very good. Um, is there anything else uh, for this evening? Does anybody else have anything to uh, share? And while I'm just waiting to uh, see if anybody uh, says anything in a moment, I was just gonna say, and congratulations again to uh, Sid, who I see has made uh, both the TC and Black Press. So I see there was a, an article today in, in the Black Press as well. So uh, well done. And it was a uh, very handsome observer's photo too. Yes. <laughs> to go along with the with the accolades. Yeah. I uh, I've been bragging about Sid to coworkers. So we can all we can all say we know Sid. <laughs> um, Chris, I was just going to say um, our next uh, FD, FDAO star party is the nineteenth, so not this coming week, but the following one, and we're having Garima Singh. Um, who's from the DAO, and she's going to be talking about some of the work that she's doing um, uh, for uh, in adaptive optics and um, a corona, cor coronagraph, coronagraphy, is that the word, how you pronounce that? Chronography um, of, uh, of direct imaging of exoplanets. So uh, that should be really interesting to, uh, um, to hear. So she'll be on the 19th. And then we're getting ready to have um, uh, possibly 
uh, a special guest for April the 16th, which is the, uh, uh, which is the next star party after that. And it will be on the Artemis program for the Canadian Space Agency. So stay tuned. We may have a famous person. Well, Laurie, um, yes. I sort of remember in the last couple of weeks, there was um, maybe a call for volunteers for doing uh, lunar stuff for Artemis. Is that, I can't remember if that's Yes, true. yes, we're going to be doing some, we're going to be doing some work um, uh, on, we just had, actually had a meeting today that was uh, about what we're going to be doing for the Artemis um, program. And one of the things that we'll be doing is to shoot the moon and have, uh, and have people taking pictures, of, uh, taking moon pictures. Um, so that'll be right up, um, right up Randy's alley. <laughs> uh, and we'll be, but I'll be giving you some more information. We're getting a whole package on the, on the 11th of April, uh, sorry, the 11th of March from the Canadian Space Agency, and we'll have some more information then. So, and there's a chance, chance that we'll be open by the May the 7th um, uh, Star Park, uh, Star, um, uh, International Astronomy Day up at the center. So we'll let you know. Yeah. There Thank will you. be an announcement from the provincial authorities on Thursday, I believe, on kind of the, the situation in BC. And I know this is a federal situation we have to yeah. deal with too. But anyway, yeah. the uh, well, one will probably affect the other, I would think. Yeah, Could be. it has made the hill rather complex because um, decisions are being made in two different locations. So. so. Yes, and the and the hill is very very slowly getting back to having people anywhere near there. So lots of people working from home, and so they're not. I think that the um, the government doesn't remember about having a public facility up there. <laughs> you know, they're thinking about the safety of the staff and and all that, which I totally understand. But uh, we're a little bit of a, a different kettle of fish up there. So they're not quite sure what to do with us. Yeah. And certainly probably lower numbers, I would guess. If, well, we'll have to see, I guess. So. Yeah. What may happen? Yeah. Uh, does anybody else have anything for us this evening? Chris, I realized I goofed earlier when I said that Gary is in charge of for VP two of um, speakers. He isn't. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's it's Brock. Or VP one. <laughs> Did you know that, Brock? I, uh, I, Dave. I think you meant Dave, Dave, Dave Payne, Payne, Margie. Yeah. Sorry, yeah. sorry, that's not Brock. It's not Brock yeah. either. <laughs> I didn't think so. I was like, I don't remember it's, that. But it's, I didn't sign up should, for that, did I? Somebody should uh, tell me. New job. Dave, You've been voluntold. It's yeah. Dave. Yeah. Very good. Yeah. Well, I, I was I, just I, waiting for the, the the job descriptions to come out. I don't. I, I wasn't sure what I signed up for. <laughs> yeah, right. As a matter of fact, David, I almost said that when Margie told me that I was responsible for the speakers. I said this was a strategic, a strategic error in my part. Not to get the job description first. <laughs> well, the, the one the one line job descriptions are on the website. Just click on about us. <laughs> all right no no uh, excuses you know you know what you got into <laughs> yeah a good friend of mine whose name starts with r and the last a good friend of mine whose name starts with r and the last initial is g and his first name said oh you don't have to do very much <laughs> <laughs> and i uh, believed him gary, gary uh yeah you were right uh you don't have to do very much it's the uh, the uh, vice president number one that uh, is responsible or in historically has been responsible for recruiting uh, speakers for our monthly meetings. Okay, good. Great. Sure, I'm, I'm going to have to start networking then. But I think we should leave Margie in, in charge of casting because it's a lot more fun. <laughs> yeah, right. She's, it's terrifying is what it is. It's not fun. Oh, no. Oh, boy. Anyhow, all's well that ends well. Yeah. Well, you've got 30, 36 people on online right here today that every single one of them could give a presentation of some kind with some of their background. So there you yeah, go. Right. That's, a, that's a very good point. You know, I was just thinking about yeah. that desperation here while I was sitting here. <laughs> yeah. 
No, we don't. It's not even desperation. <laughs> yeah, and last year, I mean, this last this last what six months or so, um, it's just been. Uh, some of the speakers have come out of presentations that that I've done on uh, women, and um, and then other speakers have just uh, emerged out of somebody has contacted. Uh, Kind of turned out to be me. Somebody who contacted me, or somebody, or somebody else knows somebody else, and it it's kind of happened organically. It's lovely. It's lovely, That's and you've done great, a great Margie. job, Margie. You've done a great job. Yeah, I, I, I'm good at delegating too. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds good. good. <laughs> there you go. But just as an example, I mean, you know, this evening we didn't have too much on the agenda, and you look at how much we've looked at this evening, and you know, it just happened. And yet any one of those could be, you know, one of those, say, group or whatever pictures could make a presentation on, you know, what I discovered in this area and, you know, how I did it. And, and now, you know what a good topic would be, Chris, for anybody would be what I now know that I wished I knew 10 years ago. That would be a very good topic for the hobby of astronomy, let me tell you. Is that only about photography? Oh, it's about it could be anything. Could be anything. <laughs> Great. So, any last words? Are there any SIGs this week, David? No. No. <laughs> Short answer. That was easy. Good. Yeah. There, there, there should be. Uh, I think the next one is astrophotography. Right. But I think that's a couple of weeks. Couple weeks. Yeah, it looked like in the Zoom calendar, there wasn't anything this week. So other than us, so on tonight, so that's good. No, but I, I'll, t I'll tell you one thing. I, I, I just wondered um, whether there was any interest in a specific citizen science group. Uh, the reason why I say that uh, is that uh, AAVSO has been doing a lot of webinars recently um, uh, featuring some probably pretty pretty famous people. I guess uh, Richard Berry just did one on um, on Saturday, and he was just talking about photometry and the history of photometry. And uh, for anybody who's a programmer, he he even talked a little bit about his coding of uh, AIP uh, for WIN, if anybody knows what that is. Uh, I remember it from his books. Uh, but um, Lauren Harrington mentioned that there's going to be um, a number of uh, webinars coming up uh, to do with the use of Python. Uh, in, uh, in, in the variable star work. And I'm quite interested in that. And there's uh, a lot of uh, opportunity for uh, data mining and uh, analysis of existing uh, databases as well. So if anybody's interested in that, uh, just let me know. Uh, we don't necessarily have to form a SIG on that. I just like to know who you are and if you, if you wanna sort of uh, talk about it. That's good. Yeah, maybe remind us as uh, time goes on to and yep, I will do that about what's happening and what you find out about. Uh, it does seem like uh, that uh, venture into uh, AVV was it AVSO? Is it? Uh, yeah, the AAVSO. Yeah, a -A that's right. Yeah, yeah but by, by the way, a lot of the, a lot of the lectures are actually open. You don't have to be a member. Right. And uh, I think um, I think there's a couple of really interesting ones coming up. I just I, I just don't remember who they are now, but. You just go to the site and uh, you'll see who's coming up. And just a reminder to everyone, because um, we haven't, uh, we haven't, we've kind of lost our, our champion of um, uh, trying to set up a Messier marathon, but this is uh, one of the times of the year, of course, when uh, the Messier objects may be uh, seen in a shorter period of time. But I don't know if anybody wants to put something like that together this year or whether it's even, you know, possible because often we've used the, um, site on the hill, but uh, we are still limited at how many people can be there. So, uh, Michelle was often interested in running one of those, but he is no longer here. So uh, we'll have one uh, by Zoom. <laughs> um, Martin, I think you had your hand up or? I did, and then I realized that somebody was asking for a volunteer, so I quickly put it down. Again. <laughs> okay, thanks, Martin. Too late. <laughs> uh, I, I, I was just going to ask. I was just going to add something in before the end of the thing, but then I realized. Yeah, please, no, please go ahead. Questions. That was all I was going to say. Please go ahead. Uh, it was a book recommend, and I can't remember if anybody. If I can't remember if I actually got this recommend from this group, so this could be a very circular and meta recommendation from somebody on this group to me, to then back to this group again. Uh, I just finished reading this, uh, which is the last Stargazers. Yep. Oh, thank, thank um, you, Martin. 
Emily's going to be speaking on the AAVSO webinars. She's coming up actually in a few so, weeks, actually. So if anybody is interested in this book, it's, it's just a delightful um, trot through the non-technical life of a modern day astronomer is probably the easiest way of putting it. Um, so it's literally about what, you know, because I think that for people that are interested in astronomy, we kind of have an idea about what the what the science is and stuff like this. But just the day to day of like trying to, you know, finding scorpions in your boots in the desert in Chile and stuff like that. It's kind of a lot of that. And it's just a really um, I just read this last week, just finished it last week. I was waiting for it to come out in paperback. And it's uh, it's just a really lovely read. So um, she covers a lot of ground um, from the sort of people who used to climb up into the prime focus cage all the way through to, I guess the reason why it's called the last stargazers is because we're, we're reaching a point in time where people aren't, aren't really even going to the observatories to do the observation. So it's a kind of a, it's a, it's a kind of a, a love letter to that kind of stuff. If you like, it's a, it was a great read. Yeah. It's also available in Kindle if you want to get the bargain price. And, and audible as well. Yeah. Pages. Go. I got pages. I got pages. <laughs> yeah, I still like books. <laughs> Anyways, any final comments? I'm going twice, I guess. If not, we'll be back uh, next week. And uh, so hope uh, you'll uh, come back and join us again. And um, next week again, we'll be um, uh, basically open to whatever we're somebody's print presenting. Oh. It's funny, Dave, your hand got raised again. Dave Robinson, is that no problem? Something's touching your keyboard. <laughs> anyway, don't worry, don't worry about it. That's good. Um, yeah, something something funny is going on with my keyboard. It's just yeah, yeah. putting my hand up. Just wants to raise your hand there. Wants to let us know you're still there. Um, yeah. yeah. So next week again is going to be um, you know topics from the floor, as it were. So if you've got things to share, think about it, and you've got some. Uh, uh, Got a few days to put it together and let me know uh, uh, when I, I put out the announcement on Saturdays. And, uh, and we should be having a speaker on the 21st. And thank, thank you, Dwayne, yeah, for your thanks. <laughs> Anyways, good night, everyone. Take care. Good night. Thanks very much. Thank good night.